This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. Once we recognize the relative and subjective nature of the concept of health, we can begin to explore how the system's view of life can help us develop a corresponding system's view of health. Systems thinking is process thinking, and hence the system's view sees health as an ongoing process. Rather than defining health as a static state of perfect well-being, the systemic conception of health implies continual activity and change reflecting the organism's creative response to environmental challenges. Since a person's condition will always depend on the natural and social environment, there can be no absolute level of health independent of this environment. The continual changes of one's organism in relationship to the changing environment will naturally include temporary phases of ill health, and it will often be impossible to draw a sharp line between health and illness. Moreover, health is a multidimensional process. From the system's point of view, the experience of illness results from patterns of disorder that may become manifest at various levels of the organism, biological as well as psychological, and also in the various interactions between the organism and the larger systems in which it is embedded. This means that life's biological, cognitive, social, and ecological dimensions which are integrated in the system's view of life, correspond to similar dimensions of health. Valeria Telles interviews Fritjof Capra, the author of The System's View of Life, A Unifying Vision. Fritjof Capra, PhD, physicist and systems theorist, was a founding director, 1995 to 2020, of the Center for Eco-Literacy in Berkeley, California. He is a fellow of Schumacher College, UK, and serves on the Council of Earth Charter International. Capra is the author of several international bestsellers, including The Tao of Physics, The Web of Life, and The Science of Leonardo. He is co-author with Pierre Luigi Luisi of the multidisciplinary textbook, The System's View of Life. Capra's online course is based on his textbook. Meet Fritjof at capracourse.net and fritjofcapra.net. Here's the interview with Fritjof Capra. In your own words, who is Fritz Jof Capra? Uh, hello, I'm a scientist and I am also an author and I am an environmental activist and environmental educator. Those are sort of the main branches of my professional life. Uh, I'm a husband, father, tennis player, lover of jazz, and many other things. My first official question is your understanding and idea of life itself. What is your understanding of what this is as an experience for all of us human beings? Well, I have uh, thought and written about the nature of life for the last 30 years or so from a scientific perspective. And I uh, published various, several books about it. The last one is called The System's View of Life, which is a grand synthesis of my understanding of life. And uh, I can summarize this in terms of four key characteristics of life. The first is that life organizes itself in networks, the second, 
life is inherently regenerative, life is inherently creative, and life is inherently intelligent. And in my synthesis, those four characteristics are woven into a coherent conceptual framework that integrates the biological, the cognitive, the social, and the environmental or ecological dimensions of life. So to go into detail, of course, would take a lot of time, but I like these four characteristics. I've come up with those recently because they, you know, these words are very evocative that life is inherently regenerative, Mm -hmm. creative, and intelligent. I guess the question that comes to mind is why have we become so separated from our own wholeness as being life? Well, Valeria, that's a, a very deep question. And you are addressing uh, something that is often referred to as the human condition. And that is the fact that because of our uh, reflective consciousness, our language, our conceptual thought, our self-awareness, we have the ability to create abstract mental images All our concepts, our ideas, our values uh, are all abstract mental images. And these uh, mental images have allowed humanity to create the great works of art, of philosophy, of science, and, and so on, of spirituality. But they have also had a shadow side, and that is that we have the tendency to abstract ourselves out of reality, so to speak, to separate ourselves and to lose the connection with the larger whole. So we need to balance this abstraction and rational thinking with uh, integration, with a sense of connectedness, a sense of belonging. And if if you wish, you could say that uh, religion originally had that role. Uh, the word religion uh, is derived from the Latin religare, which means to bind back And and I interpret this as a binding back to nature. And as you know, the word yoga in the East has the same meaning, a binding, a yoke that connects us with the larger reality. Let me ask you this one. If life had one purpose, one purpose only, what would that be? The one purpose would be the continual maintenance, self maintenance and self-perpetuation. Life has maintained itself, maintained its living networks and and perpetuated and uh, enlarged and evolved those living networks for billions of years. So the purpose of life is nothing else than life itself. That is such a beautiful picture to have. I often meditate on that and reflect very often, have the conversations and all this. So I talked to you briefly off record about Advaita Vedanta. It's a religious philosophy that I have been studying for a while. So when it comes to your understanding of life, do you somehow relate that to Advaita? Well, not specifically because I don't know it that well, but I related more generally to the Eastern mystical traditions in Hinduism, of which Advaita is part, uh, in Buddhism and in the Chinese Taoism, which which then was transformed into Zen in China and Japan, Japan and and around the world. And so those uh, mystical traditions all share a basic sense of belonging to a larger whole, a basic sense of uh, cosmic unity, which is the very essence of spiritual experience. And in my writing career, I have actually started with that way back in the 1970s, 
by discovering uh, fascinating parallels between the basic concepts of modern physics, my original field of uh, research and, and activity, and the basic ideas in those Eastern mystical traditions. And that is explored in my first book, which I called The Tao of Physics, uh, unifying, you know, an Eastern concept Tao and a Western concept of, of science, of physics. Did you find in your researches the common thread between science and non-duality and spiritual fundamental truth? Uh, yes, uh, and I think the common thread, if you want to put it in an extreme way, is that there are no separate objects in the world. There are patterns of relationships, there are networks of relationships. So we need to shift our thinking from uh, seeing the world as a giant machine. This is the image that was created in the 17th century in Western science. Uh, to the image and metaphor of a network, that we are all interconnected, that our major problems are all interconnected, and that we need to honor and respect this connectedness with nature in our daily activities. What do you love most about being in a human body? Well, I would say I don't see myself as being in a human body, but as being a human body. And what I love most is those rare moments where the being in the body is just a constant experience without experiencing any of the details, without experiencing the environment as separate or the mind as separate from the body, just experiencing the, the sort of general process of flow, which has physical aspects and mental aspects and environmental or ecological aspects. To experience this in a, a non-verbal, very strong and ultimately undescribable way, that's, that's the greatest joy, I think, of being a physical body. Mm. Oh, I love that too. Personally, yeah. you know, I grew up in Austria and I was and still am an, an excellent skier, so I spent a lot of time skiing. And my greatest physical experiences of being a physical body, a living physical body, came with skiing in, you know, the perfect slope, the perfect movement, where I sort of dissolved into the rhythm of skiing. So that sounds to me, you know, the picture that comes to mine is being in the moment, being the experience itself, not separate. We're not separate from the experience of being a body. That can be experienced in many ways. In art, for instance, you know, when you when you listen to music or play music, when you sing in a choir, uh, when you are, uh, you know, in communion with a great work of art, you can experience these moments. In a way, it's the absence of time and space, isn't it, Frito? Right, right, absolutely. What is your understanding of freedom? What is to be free? Well, uh, here I think... Uh, I have some very exciting news for you, uh -huh. and that is that uh, the system's view of life, the understanding of life in terms of networks, in terms of patterns of relationships, uh, has uh, an, a very interesting answer to this question. And uh, the discovery has been over the last 30 years that all living organisms are autonomous beings in the sense that they act according to their own rules. They are, of course, dependent on the environment. They are influenced by the environment, but the environment does not uh, determine 
their activity or their response to external influences. This is determined by the organism itself. The organism is uh, autonomous. And moreover, in, to go into a little more detail, what has been discovered is that the response of a living organism to environmental influences is to change structurally. So, for instance, you know, when we see something or as we, as we speak right now in our conversation, there are patterns in the brain, neural patterns that are constantly changing. And also at the biochemical level in our organism, things are constantly changing. So a living organism responds to environmental influences with structural changes. And it uh, does so according to its own structure, according to its sensory apparatus and other aspects of its structure. So, for example, when, when I don't have the sensory apparatus to perceive, say, radio waves, which, which we don't, then we don't notice them. They're not there for us unless, you know, we have a, a radio and switch it on. But uh, in our organism, we cannot perceive them. So what we perceive and how we uh, respond to the environment depends on our structure. The response is not determined by environment. It is determined by our own structure. Now, it is determined by our structure, so our actions are determined, but it's our own structure. It's not a foreign force, and therefore it's also free. So our actions are both determined and free. And in, in this insight, which will take us a while to really go into, uh -huh, yeah. this insight, uh, determinism and freedom are not opposites but are, you know, different sides of the same phenomenon. Yeah, this is really major, major insight of the system's view of life. We are speaking of a paradox, isn't it? Right. The whole picture is a paradox of life. It, it is a paradox, ultimately. And as with all paradoxes, it can be transcended only by going to a new level of understanding. And that is the case also here. Would you say that a new form of understanding would be seeing, being able to see the big picture? As, as I put it, to think systemically, which means to think in terms of relationships, in terms of uh, patterns, and in terms of context. And of course, context refers to the big picture, to see that everything is interrelated in the big picture. I'll be asking you questions about the system's view on health and healing. That's such a, an insightful and, from my view, a beautiful one too, the way you describe that in your book. The way I understand health from a system's point of view is that as we are embedded as networks within networks, so there are also various levels of health. There is individual health, there is uh, social health, the health of a community or a society, and there's ecological health, the health of our surrounding ecosystems. And you could even say, ultimately, there's planetary health, the health of Gaia, our living planet. And, and this is not only fascinating intellectually, but is really important just today. Just think of the COVID pandemic under which we are all suffering at the moment and have been for the last two years. It is a, an issue of planetary health. It, the coronavirus had ecological origins when it jumped from animal species to humans because yeah. of our massive intrusion and destruction of ecosystems. It has social aspects because of uh, the necess necessity to um, vaccinate people 
regardless of their socioeconomic position or in which countries they live. If we don't get vaccinated globally, uh, the virus will continue to, to mutate. So uh, just this is an example of how all health has individual aspects, social aspects, ecological aspects, and planetary aspects. That's the amazing thing about your work. It's whole. You bring the all parts together. Yeah, and this is especially important when it comes to our major global problems, whether we talk about energy, the environment, climate change, economic inequality, or now, as I said, the, the COVID pandemic, None of these problems can be solved in isolation. They are what I call systemic problems, all interconnected and interdependent, and we need to think systemically in order to solve them. And this is what I write about, and this is what I teach in, in my online CAPRA course, the, this systemic thinking to understand the world's major problems. I see everyone, people, human beings as life itself, I don't see the center there. You had that as an intention when you wrote the book and you started the online course? Copy yes, course. yes, uh, absolutely. My values have been uh, very much influenced during the 1960s, which was my formative period. I was in my 20s at the time. And since that time, I have never been a pure theorist, but always been concerned with the well-being of humanity and, and with social change and social improvement. And so that has always been part of my work from, uh, you know, the 1980s on, I would say. I wanted to thank you again for doing what you do. Welcome. Your work, the most recent one, the system's view of life, is that um, something that it's past theories? It uh, has become a fact? Well, I would say it is at the forefront of science. And I should also say, should acknowledge that I wrote this book, The Systems View of Life, with a friend and colleague of mine, Pierluigi Luisi, who is a professor of biochemistry at the University of Rome. And uh, so it is a synthesis of what we consider the most advanced understanding of life today. It's interesting how some of us still don't understand that some of us, I would say most of us. The, the problem with our sciences and our academic world in general is that it has been organized in a very fragmented way. So we have different disciplines we have different academic departments. We have different special journalists, different special degrees. And although specialization is a good thing, we have gone too far and have lost the, the integrative uh, dimension of human knowledge and of science. And so the system's view of life is inherently multidisciplinary because life itself, you know, has uh, biological dimensions, ecological dimensions, social dimensions, cultural dimensions, and so on. And so the systems view needs to be taught in a multidisciplinary way. And that's what I'm doing in my course. And I'm, I'm happy to say that similar courses uh, are being taught now at various universities. And this course has served as a model for others to teach the system's view of life. Talk to me for a moment about the conventional Western approach to health and healing and your integrative vision, which you just talked well, about now. I can relate to the, this to uh, what, I, what I said before, the change of worldview that we are going through now in science and in society is essentially a change from seeing the world as a machine to understanding it as an interconnected network. And so with regard to health, the tra traditional conventional view is 
of the body as a machine and of the mind as a separate entity. And so when there's something wrong with the machine, you try to find the part that is not functioning and fix it. And that has been the approach to Western medicine in terms of, you know, surgery and and uh, drugs, medications to fix parts chemically. The systems view sees an integrated organism with mind and body integrated and the entire organism being in a state of continual fluctuations. What, whatever we can observe in our organism fluctuates body temperature, humidity, hormonal balance, brain waves, and so on. Everything fluctuates, and that gives us flexibility. And so the state of health is a fluctuating state, a state of dynamic balance, which involves the biological aspects of the organism, but also the psychological or cognitive aspects and its interactions with the social and uh, natural environment. So it's a multidimensional systemic approach. That seems to be very complex, right? Even by listening to you yes, I mean, it's, and being it's a human being. <laughs> and, and therefore, at, in health care, it needs collaboration. You know, a single person with, you know, a specialist, either surgeon or, you know, an internal physician or, or nurse uh, can, cannot do healthcare by themselves. There needs to be a collaborative effort to reflect the systemic view of health. And again, you know, we are now in a change of paradigms, in a change of worldviews, and we have health centers that embody that collaborative collective effort. So it goes back to the, your view, which is so, I mean, resonates so true, of just recognizing that and not just isolating issues of body and mind. Yeah, and integrating the various dimensions. And, and in fact, you may know there is a whole new approach to healthcare now, which is known as integrative medicine. And and in our book, The Systems View of Life, we, we have a whole chapter about that. I love the um, this term dynamic balance, because we often talk about balance and harmony as a, almost like as a destination, a place to be, a static place to be but it doesn't really exist. So yes. I, I love and, that. And also the dynamic balance in terms of continuous fluctuations uh, allows us to keep balance in different environments. You can't separate the state of health from the state of the environment. So uh, to be healthy or unhealthy is always relative and it's always a balancing act. And with that in mind, what are the main causes of imbalances in, in the organisms? Well, there, there are many, and uh, the imbalance could, can be biochemical, which relates to nutrition if we eat unhealthy food, or yeah. it can be psychological stress, it can be emotional stress, it can be stress in our in our family life, in our personal relationships. And, uh, you know, what is very relevant today, stress when we think about humanity's future with the existential threat of the climate catastrophe, uh, that is enormously stressful. And so yeah. uh, all these stresses, and I should say that in the systems view, the imbalance manifests itself as stress. Stress is a state of imbalance. And ongoing stress, as we all know, is harmful and, and can lead to illness. There's another passage in the system's view on health that caught my attention, where you talk about the connection between serious illnesses and transformation. Yes. Talk to me for a moment about that for youth. Yes, well, this again, you see, the, the system's view of health derives from the system's view of life. So in order to say what a healthy organism is, 
we need to know how, this, how to describe a living organism. And this, the systems view sees a living organism as a network that embodies feedback loops. And the feedback can be balancing, self-balancing, or it can be self-transcending, leading to the emergence of a new state of health. And this typically happens when you, we go through a period of crisis. And uh, yeah. there are many cases where people experience an existential illness and go through this crisis, and when they come out on the other side with a new state of health, they feel healthier than they did before. And so it's a transcendence or a transcendence to a new state of being to a new state of health. And of course, this transcendence can be experienced also, uh, you know, mentally or, or spiritually in in a spiritual experience and in a spiritual quest. What is the intention of life itself in this case? It show some other dimensions? To preserve itself ah, and you. evolve to, to, you know, ever more uh, complex and, and fulfilling and healthy states of being. Yeah, I love that as a vision, that life itself, it's very supportive of itself. And, and it's trying to, coming from the perspective of a human being, it's to see, as you said, to become healthier, fulfilled and happy, right, Frank Joe, for like uh, being able to see this, like I see this, whatever's happening here, is already fulfillment. So joy arises instantly when that thought uh, comes Absolutely. to mind. And what, what we talked about before is this intense experience of physicality in a spiritual experience. I've, I, I mentioned my experiences in skiing. Uh, that is, of course, an experience of intense happiness at the same time. What is success to you today? How do you define success? That's uh, a, a difficult one. I have not thought about this much except in a very personal way. And in, in a personal way, it is having a professional life and making a living doing the things I really love. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. have my professional life and my hobbies I don't have a job to make money and hobbies to enjoy. <laughs> yes. You know, my writing, you know, I'm a scientist and a writer. And I can tell you, I write all the time. When I don't write for two or three weeks, I have to write at least some notes or an article <laughs> or, or some, some dialogue. So I feel happiest in, in my work. That's wonderful to hear. Yeah, when work becomes just a way of living. And let's see another question. I'll ask you this one. What is another word for life? For life? Yeah. That is not so easy. I, I, don't, I don't think I, I can find another word because it's a, a complex pattern of organization that continually maintains itself, that continually evolves. And uh, I could say, uh, you know, life in another language, my native language is German, so Leben is, is another mm -hmm. word for life for me, but that's just a different language. With that in mind, I do hear a lot, and I have kind of adopted this idea as well, this concept that life is unconditional love in the sense that it's very supportive of itself, no matter what happens and how it happens, it's trying to thrive. That is true. And, and actually, when you go to the biological roots of love, you can see that there is a profound sense of connectedness and a longing for connectedness uh, throughout all various complex levels of life. Another question I have for you, the ending question, is about the idea of life after death. Do you have any visions, expectations? 
Uh, no, I I go back and forth. You know, I've I've studied uh, Eastern philosophical and mystical traditions. I'm familiar with the concept of reincarnation, uh, but I am an agnostic. Yeah, I sometimes go back and forth, but I don't have any firm view. Yes. My last question is: What are three things you wish everyone to experience before they lose the body, before they die? A, I would say a fulfilling human relationship, a profound sense of being embedded in nature, and a sense of uh, physical well-being and health in the way we have talked about it. Yes, uh, another billion times to those truths uh, and to those wishes. Thank you so much, for Joth, for your work. Well, thank you, Valeria. It has been a great pleasure. Yeah, thank you again. We'll talk soon. Bye for now. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Fritjof Capra and his work, please visit capracorse.net and fritjofcapra.net. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now. <laughs>